So what we determined was that these guys are not just nice and curvy and that's it, but that actually they are intimately connected and we, we noted it. We noted it first through a geometric, a strange geometric property, which was about reflectivity. Do you remember that? Right. Uh, if, for example, you're at two spots in a whispering gallery, two very specific spots, if you speak in a very quiet voice, then someone at the other point, which was, what were those two points? I was significant about them. They were the foci, right? If you're at one of the two focuses, foci, whatever, you can hear uh, very clearly just by whispering. Right? So we've got this shape. The circle, of course, we thought, okay, this, um, I'm going to make this a bit messy. This is what we had for the ellipse, right? We determined that rather than just having one focus, like the parabola, because you've got this symmetry, we talked about the symmetry, there are two different axes, we call them the, what were the names of the two different axes? Minor. The major and minor axes, because one's longer than the other. Because you've got these major and minor axes of symmetry, which the parabola doesn't, the parabola's just got one axis of symmetry. That's why you could say, well, you know what? I could generate this ellipse, I could generate it by saying, look, just have a look at, at that side, right? Or just as equally, I could do it from the other side, right? So being that, either of them, like both of them are equally valid competitors for the time of, I'm the real focus. Well, you just have to say they're both there, right? But as you climb back into this, right, it's like, well, you don't get a directrix anymore. Or you could say it has an infinite number of directrices and you've just got the one center. These guys have kind of migrated into the middle and coalesced, right? Which was the reverse of what we said was happening with eccentricity. Do you remember that, right? Where did we start with? We gave a numerical definition for eccentricity in general, right? What is eccentricity? It's a, it's a ratio between the distance to the focus and the distance to the directrix, right? So you've got this kind of scenario happening. We said, and I better move this a bit closer so it's actually going to look a little bit accurate. We said with the problem, which we we're quite familiar with, every point, every point, if you compare the distance from the focus to the directrix from that point on the locus, the ratio should be one to one, one to one. And we're very familiar with that. We've sort of done that to them. So that's that one to one ratio. Okay, but on the ellipse, you're getting a different kind of relationship, something like this distance to this distance, right? Maybe that <coughs> might be one to two, right? So we would say the eccentricity was a half, okay? We took that idea and we said, well, what happens? I mean, you can't put in eccentricity equals zero because that's a ratio. You can't have a ratio be zero. But through the magic of limits, we determined if you have eccentricity of zero, this is kind of where you end up. Right? So here were our scenarios. You said, if you have an eccentricity of zero, come in, a circle is what you have. If you have an eccentricity of one, a parameter is what you have. And anywhere between there, anywhere between there, if you are bounded from naught to one, then you get the limit. Okay. Now, the question we ended with was, well, what happens when you, you can't really have a negative ratio? That kind of doesn't make, it makes as little sense as an eccentricity of zero, makes sense. Um, what happens, therefore, if you go the other direction and you break out past, you know, an eccentricity greater than one, okay? Now, we will ask and answer that question, I promise, okay? However, before we do that, we've kind of just really, we've just met the ellipse. We've really just met him. And there's a lot more to understand about him. That's why I've given this the heading that I've got. Okay? So there are two particular things we're going to focus on today with the ellipse. So I'm going to do that. And the little subheading you can make is um, forms for the ellipse. Forms for the ellipse. When I say forms, I kind of mean like, just like a line equations have forms, right? Uh, or even the equation of parabola, right? I could take a parabola and I could express it in these terms. I could say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And of course we would call that general, general form, right? But this is not the only form you can express a parabola in, right? What other form could I express it in? 
thinking in Locke's land, because that's kind of what I'm at at the moment. I could express this like x minus h squared equals uh, 4a times y minus k is usually the convention. Um, so this, this can represent exactly the same parabola, but it tells me something different. What does it tell me? It tells me where the, the, vertex. the vertex is, right? So we call this we call this vertex form, right? So you've got different forms there. Now the forms that we're going to explore are not just different versions of the same thing, but if you want to actually have an ellipse that behaves a little bit differently, okay? All the ellipses we've been looking at have been in this form so far. Okay? Now, two important things to note about this. Two important things. Number one, where is the center of this ellipse? Where is the center? It, it, it's at the origin, right? Now, the reason we've been doing that, center at uh, zero, zero, the reason we've been doing that is because it just makes the algebra simpler. It makes the numbers simpler. Good morning. We, uh, we saw actually early on what happens when you have uh, an ellipse and it's not at the center. It still works out. You still end up getting something like this, but it's just, it's just messy. It's harder to work with, okay? So it's center zero, zero. The other thing I want to note is that so far, and I'm going to try and keep this consistent, we've been saying that A is greater than B. Like of these two numbers, A is the bigger number, right? Now do you remember, on this guy, what is the significance of A and B? Like what features do they tell us about the ellipse? Do you remember? The major and minor axis. Yeah, very good. This will tell you the major axis, and this is the minor axis. So as an example, you don't have to write this one down because you've already got it in your book. If you saw this, you would conclude that on the horizontal axis, your intercepts are negative 4 and 4, and your y-intercepts are negative, negative 3 and 3. So you've gone further this way than this way. Now, that's your major axis going that way. Okay. So what I've got here, like without saying it, is the horizontal axis is the major axis. Right? So I'm actually going to write this here like so. Horizontal. Major axis. So we'll talk about it as I go through, hopefully. Okay. So being that, we've got these two features that are implied by this form. And I should say, uh, I guess I'll put it right at the top. So what we're suggesting is that A is greater than B. Some, um, some books will not say that. Um, I hope you can see, like, these are just numbers. They're just numbers. You can label them however you like. Like, I didn't have to call this ax squared plus bx plus c. I suppose I, called, I could have called it dx squared plus ex plus f. Not a different thing. Just different labels, okay? Some, some textbooks you will find will not call a and b, like, in terms of size. They will attach it to the x or the y, or I should say the x squared or the y squared. Okay? The important thing is you pay attention to which one is larger. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what happens if you muck around with each of these. Let's think about moving it. Let's think about translating it first. And um, just like I said with this parabola over here, let's move the center to h, k. If I did that, if I translated h units to the right and k units upwards. And of course, if they're negative, then I'm going to go to the left and downwards, right? What difference will that make to my equation? X minus h squared. X minus h squared on, now this is the major axis, right? I haven't done any um, squishing or squashing. All I've done is I've just moved it. I've just slid it over, okay? So this guy, which talk, tells me about the proportionality, is still the same, okay? And then the same way, just like I have here, I saw that as well, didn't I? Um, I've got y minus k squared. There's my vertical shift. Okay. Now, because in this case, a is still bigger than b, I still have a horizontal major axis, so I'm not going to restate that. Okay.